morning fellowship. How are you guys? Did you guys have a good Thanksgiving? Hope everybody had a chance to get together with family and a few friends. I know we had a, a great time. It was a weird time for us as a family. Some of us could make it, some of us could not. Some were sick, some were healthy, and yet through all of that, through Zoom and all the things that we have out there, we were able to connect with most of the people that we need to get connected with. So I hope you guys had a, a great Thanksgiving as we did uh, we, if you're uh, joining us this online, welcome. We're glad that you're able to join with us in this way. Uh, it's just a great opportunity for us as a church family to get together. Whether we're in the building here like this or even online, we're able to get together as a church family. It's just been a, a great holiday season, the kickoff for this holiday season. Well, like Aaron said, we are in our series that we're calling Stand Out. And this is the final week of, of this series, Stand Out, where we're looking at four characteristics of, of the Christian walk. Four characteristics of our faith that, that, that you can't help but to stand out in our society if you embody these four characteristics. And each of these characteristics, each and every week as we're walking through them, we're asking the question, am I really a fan or a follower of Jesus? Am I really a follower of Jesus or am I what culture would call a fan of him? Now, not everybody wants to stand out. Right? It's not, not everybody wants this, this to, to be right out in the limelight and, and in the forefront. This week I was thinking of, a, of times in my life when, um, when I did not want to, when I wanted to blend in. And I, and I was thinking of when I was uh, 17 years old. I Many of you guys know the story. When I was 17 years old, I joined the army. It's a great picture of me there, right? 17 years old, uh, I was actually a junior in high school when I joined the Army National Guard. And I went down to Fort Benning, Georgia. To, uh, to basic training. Now, I don't know how you, you think you would fare in, in Army basic training, but you go down to the place called the Home of the Infantry for basic training. Now, I was 17. I was in good shape. I was a wrestler. I was athletic. I had tons of confidence. And so physically, it wasn't that hard. Physically, I did fine. My problem was I was 17 years old. And everybody who I was with was in their 20s to early 30s which means there were some guys that were part of, of the company that I was with that was literally almost twice my age. And so in that moment, I had that, that moment of like, I just kind of want to creep into the middle, right? Because in the army, there's a, there's a, a, a concept, when you, especially in basic training, you don't want to be the best, right? The guy in the front. But you don't want to be the worst, because, you see, the best, when you go down to basic training, the drill sergeants who basically have the power of God down there, right, they can make or break you. They can make your life completely miserable or they can make it fun. Um, they know who the best guy is. And the best guy they expect a lot from. You don't want to be that guy. But you also don't want to be the worst guy because they know you too. And if you're the worst guy and they know you, they're going to make your life miserable. And so you don't want to be that guy. So you just kind of want to stay somewhere in the middle because it's in the middle where all of a sudden you get to disappear. And there I was, I was 17 years old, and I was trying to just blend in, trying to, to, to disappear. And I was standing in a formation, and, and if you know anything about the military, I'm standing in a formation, we have our, our platoon, which is part of a company, there's about 200 guys there, and you're standing there, it was called parade rest, where you got, it's kind of like a tension, only, I don't know why they call it parade rest, because you don't get to rest, you just got to stand here like this. And I'm standing here like this, in parade rest, and all of a sudden we found out we were, had to wait for the trucks to arrive, these trucks that were coming to take us downrange to, to do some training. Now again, if you know anything about the military, you know that when they say that these trucks are late, you might be waiting for a few minutes or literally hours standing here like this. And we had no idea which one it was going to be. I was standing right there and I guess the drill sergeant uh, decided to pass the time with some entertainment because out of nowhere, I, I heard the drill sergeant say, McGinnis, 
get up here. And immediately, you know, your heart starts to beat and you take a step back and you run down here and you run up. By the time I get in front of my drill sergeant, right in front of the drill sergeant like this, my heart's beating through my chest. I'm sweating profusely, not because I was running or because it was hot, but because at that moment I was scared to death. Right, all you can think about if you've ever been in this situation is don't mess this up, don't mess this up because the, the drill sergeants, again, they can make or break you at this point point. and so you gotta remember they're not a sir, they're a drill sergeant so you answer everything, yes drill sergeant, no drill sergeant and, and, and you're trying not to make all these mistakes otherwise they'll drop you right there in front of all of these people. See, all of a sudden, no matter how much I tried, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that from that moment on, it was impossible for me to blend in. Because for some reason, the drill sergeant knew my name. And I kept thinking to myself, am I this guy or am I this guy? <laughs> I don't know why, but he knew my name. See, sometimes you can't help but to stand out. Sometimes you don't, you don't look for it. You don't, you don't try to, to be above everybody else. You don't try to stand out anyways. You just can't help it. Sometimes it just happens. We're looking at the, the book of 1 Corinthians. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians. We're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians where the apostle Paul is, is addressing a church that he actually started. He planted this church just a little while ago. And now he's writing them a letter as he's addressing to them. Uh, as he looks at them, he says, he, he, he sees the fact that the culture in this place, Corinth, this ungodly, this sinful, pagan culture, um, it's no longer just in the community, but it also is in the church now as well. And so when you look at the church, he, he, he looked at the church, and when you see the church and you look at the community, you can hardly see a difference between the two of them. And he was completely floored by this. He couldn't understand how this could happen because he knew that if you were a follower of Christ, there is no possible way you couldn't help but to stand out in that culture. That culture was so pagan, you couldn't help but to be the one who stands out. And so he starts to address all of the things uh, that's going on in the life of the church that you also see going on in the life of the community. He addressed the lack of unity. We talked about that in week one. The fact that, that people couldn't get along with one another, there's a lack of unity. He, he addressed purity, specifically sexual purity, but, but any kind of purity that's going on. He says that, that this is a culture that doesn't strive for purity, and I'm starting to see in the church and out of the church this desire or this lack of desire to strive for purity. It says all of a sudden, he, he looks at the, the freedom that we all have, the personal freedoms, and people were getting things all mixed up, and they were, they were trying to think that the freedom that they had was so that they could do whatever they wanted to do, and they were getting all confused of the fact that the freedom was given to us so that we could um, serve other people, so that we could give up this freedom for others. And this week, the Apostle Paul, he turns to the one area, he says, this is at the heart of the church, the very core of who the church is. This is, if you possess this, it is impossible not to stand out in this culture. And it's the view of love. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13, one of the most famous passages of love. Many people have this, this passage of love, they had it said at their wedding and things like that. Here's what it says. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all kinds of mysteries and all knowledge, and I do not have faith that can, and I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I have I gain nothing. Paul goes into one of the most detailed parts of scripture right here. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now the greatest of these, uh, now these remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. See, love is one of the milestones of the Christian walk. 
It, it is at the heart of who the Christian is. Uh, there, there's a, 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 a scholar, uh, Francis Schaeffer, he's a philosopher, Fra- Francis Schaeffer, he wrote a book one time called The Mark of the Christian, where he identifies love as the cornerstone of this Christian walk. And he says, we can't expect for the world to believe that the Father sent the Son, that Jesus' claims are true, that the Christianity is true unless the world sees some reality of the oneness in true Christians. You see, how we get along with each other, how we get along with one another matters. You see, it speaks volumes to an unbelieving world around us. I'd go as far as to say that it's not what you say, but what they see that really matters. It's not what you say, but what they see that really matters. Now, before we get into this, we're going to answer the question, why is love so important? Or as the philosopher and scholar Tina Turner put it, what's love got to do with it, right? So what does love have to do with this? Well, he says that in verse 13, he says that the, uh, these three that remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So practically speaking, how does this play out? Well, faith, faith is what we believe in right? Faith is a thing that we believe in. It says in Hebrews that it's a certainty of the things that are hoped for and proof of the things that are not seen. It's what we believe in. It's we have faith in these things to come. Hope is what we're counting on today. Hope is, is again, in, in, in uh, Hebrews it says hope is the anchor for our soul. It's what we anchor it on today. But love, love is proof that it all matters. Love is the proof that we give that all of this matters. The Apostle John says it like this. He says, the one who does not have love does not know God. Because God is love. And in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. You see, as a follower of Jesus, love is not an opinion. You can't, you can't go in and out of having love. Matter of fact, John goes as far as to say that if you look at someone's life and they don't have love, they're not a loving person, it's not expressed in who they are and how they live their life, John says they probably don't even know God. Because God is love. Jesus says that this, you will know that you are my followers, my disciples, if you love God one another. He says that everyone, everyone is going to know that you're my followers because of your love. See, it's not what you say, but what they see that really matters. What you say points people to Jesus, but what they see shows them what you really believe. And even as I was writing this, I don't know how you're feeling now. You're, you're probably feeling, if you're like me, you're feeling pretty good. Because most of us believe that we are loving people. I very rarely have I walked with people that, that have just said, I don't love people, people don't love me. I, like, I mean, we just don't go like that. Right? We, don't, we don't feel like we're just unloving, uncaring people. We're, we're very quick to point out to other people and their actions and their attitudes and things like that, that that show that they're not loving, but we don't oftentimes see it in ourselves. For us, it plays out a little differently. It's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm not always, you know, I don't always display loving, but, but I'm a pretty much a, a loving person. I get frustrated from time to time. I'm a little impatient here or there. Uh, but but that's, that's kind of how we all roll, right? That's just the way it is. I think this is the reason why uh, the Apostle Paul really gets practical here. The Apostle Paul says, okay, let me explain what this love looks like which is really important because the Apostle Paul usually is a guy that's kind of confusing. This is the guy who said, he's trying to explain uh, what it's like to walk the Christian walk, and he says, that which I don't want to do, I do, and that which I do want to do, I don't do. And he says all these things, which gets confusing. But this is a passage where the Apostle Paul says, I'm going to lay this out super simple for you. See, the New Testament has three words for the, uh, the, the, that mean love, that they speak of the most. It's the word filio, the filio love, which is a brotherly love, which is bringing people as part of the family. You have eros love, which is a romantic love, a physical love. And then you have agape love, which we've, most of us have heard of this agape love. And agape love is this love that God has for us. 
It's a sacrificing love. It's a love that gives up. And it makes a lot of sense. Again, if you look at uh, what John says, it says God is love. And if we accept Christ into our life, if we accept God into our life, we become that conduit where God pours his love into us and we get filled with God's kind of love that we're then to give out to other people. And so he says, uh, this love that we have, this love that is, is impossible to not stand out in culture if you have this love, because this love, it's patient. This love is kind. It's not envious. It doesn't brag to others. It's not too proud. Love doesn't hurt. It doesn't dishonor people. Love's not selfish doesn't easily get angered. It's forgiving. It keeps no records of wrong. It doesn't celebrate sin, but it holds up truth in every circumstance. Above all, love is a shield that we hold out for people to come around us and have a safe place. See, when I look at the definition of love like this, how Paul actually lays this out, all of a sudden it kind of takes shape a little bit more. And I can't help but to stop and ask myself the question, when people look at me, do they see this kind of love? You think yourself a loving person, when people look at you, do they see this kind of love? Do they see someone who's patient? Or do they see someone who's frustrated all the time? Someone who gets frustrated when people don't agree with them? Do they see someone who's envious of what other people have? Or do they see someone who celebrates good fortune of others? Are you a proud person? Are you careful that the words and your actions don't harm other people? Intentionally or even unintentionally? Do you celebrate someone else's good fortune? Are you proud? Do you spend time with people who feed your ego? People who only will build you up? Or you look, at, look around for people who need you in their life so that you can help them? Are you easily angered? Do you voice that quickly? How about forgiveness? Are you someone who's a forgiving person? If you were to ask around the people in your life or they say it's very difficult to stay on their bad side because they're so loving. Or are you the type of person that writes people off very quickly? Are you a truthful person? Or do you celebrate, do you celebrate when you get away with things that you know aren't right? Are you a safe place for people to come to? When things get hard, do people come to you for security? See, this kind of love, if you have this kind of love, the person who possesses this kind of love cannot help but to stand out in our culture. It's impossible to have this kind of love, this agape love, and blend in in culture. So the Apostle Paul says to this church, I think he tells our church, he says, the unity that we've talked about, the unity that that draws all of us together, this unity, it's rooted in love. This purity, the the, the desire to live a pure life, the desire to to live your life in a way that honors it, it's got to be rooted in love. The freedom that you have and the ability to give up this freedom, it's rooted in love. In love. Matter of fact, our entire faith, our entire relationship, the the entire um, the, the entire Christian walk that we have is rooted in love. Why? Because it's not what you say, but what they see that matters. See how you live your life is proof of what you really believe. Too many fans of Jesus say that they are followers of Jesus. They come to church each and every week and they, they, they dress themselves up, they clean themselves up physically and metaphorically as they, they come to church and they, 
And they come in each and every day and they, 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 they shake hands and they, they, they say hi to people and they walk out of the church and they live their life any way that they want to. They, 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 they come here and we, we blend in well enough to get along with everybody, to, to look really good in this environment with a, a lot of other Christ followers, but not crazy enough so that people out there would see our lives and think that you're some fanatic or something like that, right? And those are fans. And guess what? When we walk out of this place, and we live our life, especially when we live our life contrary to what we see here, contrary to what we learn each and every week, people see it. That's what Pastor Aaron talked about last week when he said that, that the number one reason that non-believers don't believe in this, this loving God oftentimes is because of Christians. The Apostle Paul says that this church, when he was looking at the church and he saw the, the, the culture outside of the church and the culture within the church, he saw it and he's like, it's, there should be a difference between the two. I have to be honest, there are times when I'm frustrated when I, when I talk with my, my believing friends, with, with fellow Christians, and I see them online on, on social media and places like that. And I listen to their, their dialogue. I listen to the conversations that they have. And then I have conversations with my non-believing friends, my non-Christian friends. And guess what? Far too many times it seems as though the non-Christian friends are more loving. And that confuses me at times. See, oftentimes I see these non-Christian friends, they're there when times get hard. They're there when people need, they're there when someone has made a mistake and they're sitting in their own mess and they're trying to figure it all out and they're quick to show up. And they don't judge, they don't condemn, they just love. And that's not right. <laughs> there should be a difference between the church and who God has called us to as he pours this love, this agape love into us. There should be a difference from what we see within the church and those outside of the church. We're called to be the light of the world. It's not what we say, but what they see that matters. We're called to let our light shine before men so that people would see our good deeds, would see how we live our lives, and they would turn their attentions to God. Not what we say, but what they see that really matters. We're told, we're called to love one another to care for one another, to, 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 to pour our lives into one another, not because of, uh, of our love to God, because God loved us first. Not what we say, but what they see that really matters. See, we can say that we believe this book to be true. We can say that we believe the words that are in this, word, this book to be true. But how we live our life is proof to what we really believe. See, I want to go back to the basic training story again. It was, a, it was one of the most amazing experiences that I've had. Because there I was, I'm standing right here like this in front of the, the drill sergeant. I'm standing there and I'm, uh, to be honest, scared to death because I know that I'm just going to mess this whole thing up. As a matter of fact, he's, he stops and he says, right there in front of me, he kind of turns me around to face the entire company. So there was several platoons, so there's about 200 people, so I'm standing there facing the entire company. He says, McGinnis, I heard you're a Christian. And I remember thinking, oh no, <laughs> this isn't going to be good. And he goes, what does it mean to be saved? Now I accepted Christ when I was four or five years old. I've been a Christian most of my life. In that moment, I couldn't remember what it meant. <laughs> Scared to death. And I remember stopping. I, I turned to him. And of course, as soon as I turned to him, he dropped me and it started. I had to do push-ups. And I'm doing push-ups in front of him. I stand back up. And he goes, no, you stand and you just look at them. And you just say, what does it mean to be saved? And I told him. I went through and something along the lines of the fact that we all have sin and it messes things up in our lives. And because of that, Christ uh, sent, or God sent his son Jesus to, to die and to take our place and so that we could receive the forgiveness of sin, receive this forgiveness that he gives us and something like that. Now that was an amazing experience and eventually 
uh, after a few more push-ups, I was finally able to get back into formation. The trucks came, so we got in the truck, and we go down range, and we start doing some training. But see, it, the scary time actually came when during that training, when all of a sudden, the drill sergeant, I think I had a picture of him here. This is, what, this is the drill sergeant right here. Came to me, pulled me off to the side, and got real serious. Now, in that moment, it got real serious. Because then it gets really scary. And he stops in that moment, he stops and he looks at me and goes, McGinnis, my dad was a pastor. I grew up as a Christian all my life, but I've wandered far from him. And I'm not where I should be right now. He says, really in this moment, nobody here has a reason to believe that I'm a Christian. But I've been watching you. And, it, and it's made a difference. And he stopped and he said, I need to make a change. And he literally stops and he says, I, I need to stand out more. You see, it's not what you say, but what they see that matters. And then he made me drop and do push-ups for making him feel so guilty. <laughs> that was all right, though. It's not what, they, what we say, but what they see that really matters. Our love matters. Our love for one another matters. How we treat one another matters. Our love for the brokenhearted, our love for a broken world, it really matters. It says that of all these things, love, a faith, hope, and love, love is the greatest. Why? Because it says in 1 John, we love because he first loved us. We can love because he first loved us. You see, God loved you when you didn't deserve it. He loved you when you were unlovable. He loved you uh, the, the, when, when, when there was no reason to love you. The only reason you can show this kind of love to other people is because of how he has loved you. We forgive because we've been forgiven so much. We're patient because we have a heavenly father who's patient with us. We, we, we can point people to Jesus and live out the truth of this word because Jesus is the word. He's the truth. The greatest of these is love. So as we wrap up our series here at the end of this time, I want to ask all of us to bow our head and to close our eyes. And, and we, I just do this just so that you can eliminate any distractions around you. Before you all came, we were standing up here, Pastor Aaron and Ben and I were praying, and I was praying through that God just removes distractions from us. As we stop now and we think back over the last four weeks, and I want you to ask yourself the question, am I a fan or a follower? Am I a fan of Jesus? Someone who walks into the room each and every week and walk out of the room each and every week but live their life any way they want to. Someone who follows G Jesus when it's easy, follows Jesus when it's acceptable, but, but only then. Or am I a follower? Do you stand out? Is your life marked with unity? Is your life marked with purity? Do you use your freedom to love others well? Or have you been trying to just blend in? Is your life marked with God's love living in and through you to a broken world? Maybe you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you've been following him for some time now and like this, this drill sergeant I had you're thinking to yourself, I've really gotten off track and I've walked down the way away from him matter of fact, friends, neighbors, co-workers people, they have no reason to believe I'm a Christian if they were to look at my life if that's where you are I want to challenge you turn around take a step back move back into the arms of Jesus again God has given you a life that exceeds anything we could ever imagine. We can wrap our, our hope and our, our future and eternity in who he is. We 
We've not been called to be fans. We're called to be followers. And to be a follower of Christ is to live this out. Maybe you're here and you, as you evaluate your life, as you look at your relationship, you realize, I am a fan. I've not taken that step, that moment where I've stepped across that line of faith and I said, I'm all in, God. I belong to you. And I say that knowing that you, this may be your first or second time in church or at this place. This may be, you may have grown up here all of your life, but you still, and in your heart of hearts, you know that you have not stepped across that line of faith. And I want to challenge you. If this is who you are, God is calling you to make a decision. As we enter into this Christmas season, and this season where we focus all of our time, our attention focused on the giving of the Savior, challenge you to receive him it's as simple as just calling out to him we pray a prayer we just say God I've messed up I've made mistakes it's a sin in my life that have separated me from you and I can't do it on my own I can't I can't make it there on my own I can't be good enough on my own I can't make up for for all of my mistakes and I know and I accept that you've sent your son, Jesus, to pay the debt, to pay the penalty, to die on a cross, to pay the penalty that I couldn't pay. And I receive forgiveness. I receive your forgiveness through him. With every head bowed, eyes closed, if this is where you are and you're ready to step across that line of faith, step across from moving from a fa- from a, a fan of Jesus to a follower of Jesus, I just want to ask that you raise, slip up your hand so I can pray for you. Just slip up your hand if this is where you are in your walk. You see? Yeah. You see, I'm no longer, I, I, I'm done following from a distance. I'm I'm done following when it's easy. I want to be a follower of you for good. I want to be walking with you. Therefore, let me pray for you. God, I pray that those who've raised their hand and even those who haven't, that you've been drawing to you throughout this series, that you've been challenging, challenging each and every one of us as we've lived our lives as we've questioned whether or not we we strive for unity, we strive for purity, we strive to to sacrifice our freedom for others, we strive to live our lives in a way that loves others, as we've evaluated our lives and we've come up short. God, I pray that this is a moment of salvation. God, as many have turned their attention to you, as they've surrendered their lives, God, pray that in this moment that you enter into their lives, you change them. The scriptures say that if if this is the desire of your heart, if this is where you've been and God has taken you on this journey and you, you say, I'm all in, you receive his forgiveness. It says in that moment, the angels rejoice because in that moment, it says that we pass into eternity with him and you can have the confidence that you'll spend eternity with him. God, right now I pray for those who have been walking with you and have wandered away and have turned their attention now to you and have sought your forgiveness and said, God, I'm I'm a follower of you. I need to stand out. God, I pray that you continue to put people in their lives and encouragement throughout their week to live lives consistent of what a life of a follower should be. God, take your love, put it into them. Let them live this out in front of others in a way that draws people into a relationship with you. We give you this moment, God. I give you this service that it honors you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, fellowship, that wraps up our series on Stand Out. And I do want to encourage you, if this is who you are, walk out of the doors of this church here today. Live your life in a way that's consistent to what God has given to us right here. In a way that pours out the love that he's given to you into a broken world. Especially in this season of hope that we're entering into, this holiday season. 
I want to invite you guys all to come back and invite those to come back joining, whether it's here in the building or online, to join us as we start our next series beginning next week um, entitled Hope, as we look at uh, this gift uh, of Jesus that it was given to us um, as a Savior. So have a great week. We love you guys. Hope to see you next week.